and then we're ready. Okay. Well, they're getting used to this. We're ready. <laughs> Hang on, we're coming here. Go, slideshow. All righty. So there's the lovely picture that we didn't even need. So um, we're going to um, we're going to basically segue right into another activity that helps us understand how important it is to have a test blueprint and what the what great things you can do with it. So the first great thing we can do with it is we can check an already developed test to make sure it's actually going to have content validity. That is, it's going to match what we intend to teach or what we've already taught. Um, now we're going to look at how a test blueprint can help us give feedback to students and prepare them to self-assess and set goals. So now we're on page 18 in the handout. And this again addresses those assessment planning steps one, two, and four. What's the purpose? What's, what are the targets? How many items am I going to use? And, um, and then how do we help put that all together to help students um, become better? So in this, in this particular setup, we structure a quiz or a test so that it acts as effective feedback itself. So you aren't having to write all over it or, or do a lot of talking. And then the, the, um, the feedback then allows students to self-assess and set goals. And it also, um, it also requires that we give students the opportunity to improve before the graded event. So the idea here is that this happens before the summative. However, if you're going to be creating a summative assessment, you may want to think about creating two, you make a test blueprint, which allows you to make two forms of the same, testing the same um, learning targets, different items or different tasks, so that you can use one for this protocol, and then the other one, the next one, as your summative. So here's how this works. The teacher identifies, you identify what learning target each quiz or test item represents. And you fill out the first two columns of the form reviewing my results, which you see on page 18. So the, the, the template looks like this. And uh, as a matter of fact, this is, there is a rewritable template in your um, Castle book for this. And there's also a rewritable template in the Seven Strategies book. So in this case, this is a, um, this is a, um, an, an English language arts example. Problem number one, you just fill this form out like that. You don't hand it out to the students, you just fill it out in preparation as you are, as you are um, giving, or right before you give the test. Then you give the test, or the quiz, you correct it and hand it back, and all you've done is marked right, wrong, right, wrong. You don't have to put minus three M smiley face at the top. You don't have to put 18 out of 20 or 10 out of 20 or um, meets the standard, exceeds the standard, or, or nowhere near the standard. You don't have to put any of that at the top. You simply mark it right, wrong. And then the students transfer their results to the form. So you hand it back, you give them the form. And they look at number one, and they say, did I get number one right? Now, this is a chemistry example. Did I get number one right? Yes, I did. Number two right? Yes, I did. Number three? Yes. Number four? Yes. I made it to number five before I got one wrong. So I'm marking right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. And then I'm going to go back and examine my wrong answer. So I'm going to go back to my quiz, and I'm going to say, do I see what I did? Could I fix it without help? Does that ever happen? Do students ever make mistakes that show up wrong, but they go, oh, I knew that? Dang, or I always do that. Sure they do. As a matter of fact, that's, that was, I, I made this form after Claire and I had that talk, and she said, I see what I did, I always do that. So we talked a bit about what she did do and what she could do to keep it from happening again. Sometimes, however, we come to something, and we realize that we don't really understand what's going on there. So it goes in the don't get it column. And then we hand out, we hand out the next form, and that's on page 19, or it is on the back side, or, or you have it electronically, or whatever. Um, the students look at their results, for instance, on page 18, and they decide, which learning targets am I good at? Those are the ones I got right. What am I pretty good at, but 
it's a fixable mistake. What mistake did I make? And how can I keep that from happening again? And, and many times teachers ask students to do test corrections, which means that they, they write out the mis what I did, what I should have done, and, and what I'm going to do to keep from making that mistake again. And then the third category is, I don't get it. Those are the ones I still need to learn. And then the students make a little plan to improve. So this is an activity, once again, for you all to practice with this form. And you see on page 20 that we have a very, it's a, it's a short, it's short, so this doesn't take too long. Um, the activity is called UB Caden. Caden filled out the form on page 20. It is a, a elementary math um, after receiving his corrected quiz. Please imagine your Caden, work with a partner, use the information on page 20 to do a little self-assessment and goal setting by completing the form on page 21. So again, you have, um, you have rewritable templates for these on the CD for either the Castle or the Seven Strategies book, both. So feel free to write on your handout. So you might have to make, I'd like you also to think about the part that says, what can I do to keep this from happening again? You can just think like Caden, write whatever you want or not. Or I need to keep learning these. What can I do to get better at them? What might a third grader be able to do to get better? So we're going to take about five minutes on this activity, and then we will do a debrief of it. So go ahead and start.
So everyone's off and running. Very we'll do a little, I'm going to do a little large group like question and then they can answer. I will hardly hear it, but um, but then we will uh, do a, that roll the die debrief and then we'll okay. draw it to a close. We're not running into your lunch, are we? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we have the di we're di dice are ready. Okay. Are we running into your lunch? No, no, not at all. Okay. No, no, we're not. We're not eating until noon. Oh, well, okay. So I'm okay. No, no, you're you're oh, you're fantastic. This is this has been you know gone okay. so well so quickly. So let's get started again. Okay. okay. All right. So let's start. Let's start again. You would. Okay. All right. Let's bring it. Down, down, down. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask some debrief questions. Are we are we ready for that? Yes. Okay. Um so I'm gonna ask some questions and feel free just to say the answers out loud to anybody who's willing to listen to you. Um so here are um let's let's look at page twenty. How many problems are on this quiz? Somebody says 10, right? Good. How many did Caden get right? Six. Thank you. How many? What, what score would that be if we put a grade at the top of this? Six over 10. 60%, six out of 10, D, frowny face, whatever. So how many kids look at an assessment where they have a 60% at the top or a D or whatever it would be and begin by saying, look how much I know. Not very many. Are we doing okay? Can, can people hear? Because um, I'm not hearing what they're saying. So are we doing okay on this, Jeff? Yes. Okay, okay, good. All right. So um, how many does Caden not know, admittedly self-reporting? One. One. So what would that be if, if, if Caden had a score that represented what he, what he just really didn't know, what would that be? 90. He had 90% or an A, what, yeah, or whatever you would give it. So Caden's true score, admittedly self-reporting, is a 90%. Now, if you were going to use this data, these data, to, dis to, um, to differentiate, Caden would be in the reteach group. What would you reteach if you didn't have this form? What would you reteach Caden? Everything, probably, because you didn't have the form, you just had 60%. However, what does Caden really need to learn? He's got some fract comparing fractions and reasoning about their size issues. We're not sure what, but Caden knows. Now, if you just went with 90%, if he, if he didn't make his simple mistakes and you went with 90%, he wouldn't be in the reteach group. And yet there may be something that he really doesn't get in there. So when we ask students to think first, we can then say, those of you who missed learning target number one, go over there, or here is your assignment. Those of you who missed learning target number two, here's, come over to this group, or here is your assignment. Those of you who missed them both, come with me. It argues for having fewer 
items on, I mean, sorry, not fewer items, fewer learning targets on a quiz, quizzing more often, and using the information so that students can, can help you figure out what it is they really need to learn differently. Um, I'm wondering if this is a time that people might need to ask a few questions before we move into the closure to this activity. What do you think, Jeff? A great idea. I think, I think people are bursting with questions. Okay. Questions? Yeah, yeah, over here. Oh, a good question. Would you have the children write the answer so that you would indeed know that this is something, A, that's either fixable or to uh, diagnose that other one that is going to take more uh, effort? Indeed, I would. I would have them, um, I would have them not just because I don't trust them, um, but because it helps them with their long-term memory if they actually write out what they did wrong and then, and then they work it correctly. So not just working it correctly, but identifying where the mistake was. And if you can't identify where the mistake was, then it might not be a fixable mistake. Put yourself in the reteach group because why not? It's available. Over here. Yes. Math is very discrete um, skills. Um, so how, do, how does this work when you have something with broader things, social studies, for instance, when you have broader uh, goals, uh, targets? So different examples in, in social studies or something where the targets are maybe broader or um, have encompass more of the of complex reasoning. Oh, you want me to give you an example? I'm sorry. Um, I was waiting for an example. All right. Well, I am going to look back at one of the test blueprints that is not. Um, pardon? If you would look back at page 12. Can we go back to page 12 in the handout? These are learning targets that are a little too... Um, they're a little too simplistic for the, the way that you would be teaching about westward expansion right now. But let us say you have a quiz that you, you are teaching westward expansion and you have some things that you want students to know and then you've got some patterns of reason you want them to engage in. You can create that test blueprint. Again, this one is too simplistic, but you could create a test blueprint that had what those content, what your learning targets are on it. And with the with the number of items that you're going to going to be having, and then you simply fill the form out with uh, whatever your test blueprint for that quiz says. So um, t teachers can use this not just with selected response, but if there are multiple points um, for an an answer, if it's a written response answer. And you tell you they got two points out of four. If they don't understand where they missed their points, then it goes in the "I need more teaching." If they look at if they look at it, and you don't you don't have to write on there. Here's why you missed your points. If they look at it and they can figure out why they missed their points, then they can write that down. So it doesn't need to be just selected response. So I can't see the person who asked the question. So I don't know whether she's smiling or frowning. <laughs> so how are we doing here? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. That was. That was okay. So another another observation or something that you're thinking about. We want to teach everyone gets a chance to think about this and ask questions. On this really important point of how do you differentiate? There's a lot that went into that little example there. Yeah. How do we know that the student? self-assessing accurately. Right. Good point. So how do you know that the student is self-assessing accurately? I think self-reporting and self-assessment is one of those those areas that everyone is really concentrating on. So that's a really great way of honing in on that. We set this up so that students understand that this, that this is a quiz that counts for learning. Everything counts for learning. Some things count for a grade. 
you really need to do the, your best job possible on this in order to give you a, in order as students, we want to help them understand that that doing their best on this is help them know what they still need to work on, and it it keeps them from having to study everything over again in preparation for. If I got a sixty percent, what do I need to do to get ready for the test? Well, I have to do everything. Well, if you are accurate in your diagnosis about it's a honest about fixable mistake, I really do see it then you know what you don't need. All you need to do is you can teach yourself how to get better at that. So the purpose of this is to figure out what the best instruction is going to be for you at the point in time. So we help kids understand the purpose. And then we still have some kids who are going to mark everything fix fixable mistake because they think the reteaching is um, well, for a variety of reasons. They don't want to be in that, in that we, I still need to learn it group. Um, and when students start doing that, we just we, we kind of keep talking about why might I not do that? What happens when I when I decide that I'm just gonna that everything's all good? I don't really need more because this counts for learning. The next time we do it, however, it's going to count for a grade. So the best way to do well on the summative assessment is to is to be honest on the formative so that we can figure out exactly what needs to happen. So I think it's a matter of just being honest with the students about the purpose of it and then paying attention to who is tempted to to perhaps budget a bit and then help them see that it's actually in their best interest to to um, pay close attention to this because the whole goal here is to help you get better. And I just wanted to add something. Many teachers. Yeah, that's a really great Go ahead. Point. But I also wanted to say that part of what we're talking about is the disposition, students understanding themselves as learners. And that's one of the uh, kind of the issues that we have is how do we manage that target? How do we understand? And so what we've tried to do is to kind of elaborate that a little bit. We have a, a, an a, a, a poster over here that is to try to dig into that idea of metacognitive thinking, which is consists of strategic thinking, students knowing how to, how to solve their problems and what strategies to use, the context, whether it's math or social studies, sometimes that influences how you think. And then who am I as a learner? What are my strengths, my interests, the things that I prefer in my learning? Those are the things that you want to build in. So when you say, are you answering this question? They'll have a reference point in terms of you trying to develop them their metacognitive skills. And that is all of this idea of the seven. So that goes into the format. I think you, you need to track and understand that. And students need to have language with which they can understand that kind of thinking too. So I think that, that helps to, to really dig down in that because I don't think we ever get away from are we accurately self-assessing because we can delude ourselves. One of the most interesting things that comes out of this is um, what students say as a result. And here are some things that students say um, that teachers have reported or that we've videoed them saying. Um, when they engage in this on a regular basis as preparation for a test or as learning checks partway through, um, they say things like, um, I, didn't used to like um, I didn't used to like taking quizzes or tests, but now I like them. That's a first. Um, they say things like, um, I just used to think that math was a chore. Um, and that, that now that, now that we do it this way, I can see that, that, that it's a, it's really a set of targets and that if I keep working at it, I really can get better. Um, that I used to think of it just a chore, but now I know that it's productive struggle and I can get something out of struggle. So helping, especially our struggling students, see that, um, you know, a kid who gets a D concludes he's not very good at math. Caden does not need very many Ds to decide he's not very good at math, and third grade is too soon to decide you're not good at math. So is 12th grade. Um, and yet it isn't, Caden isn't bad at math. He's got one particular area that he needs to work on. There is a secondary application of this in your castle book on page 154. So if you have your blue book and you want to look at 154, um, it is a little different. The teachers often use this. They'll make two forms of a, of a summative exam, and they use the first one formatively. Instead of spending time doing review before the exam, the final, what they do is they give form A, 
and they use a form somewhat like this where the difference here is that the learning targets are not printed on the form. You just have a list of learning targets, which the, the students don't have that list, but they know what learning targets they're working on. And so you hand the form, um, the top half of figure 511, you hand that first part out while they're taking the test, their, pra or their, their practice test or their formative test, and they mark confident or unsure after each one. So they, they do problem number one, they know it's learning target number four. You don't put the learning target on there because if the learning target is something like knows when to use the binomial theorem, you give the answer away. So it has to be basically a numbered list. And then that, that middle bar is, they, they don't do anything more until after they turn the test in. So they hold on to this form, they turn their practice test in, you correct it, you hand it back, and then they mark right, wrong, simple mistake, don't get it. But then when they're doing their analysis, and that's the bottom part, my strengths, what I got right, and I, and I was confident about it, my highest priority for study, I got it wrong, and it wasn't a fixable mistake. And then what do I need to review? I got it right, but I got lucky, or I got it wrong, but I see what I did. And then teachers spend a couple of days doing review, focused on, on the, the highest priority need, learning targets, in small group instruction. Anybody joins, students do their own reviews based on their own diagnosis of what they need, and then they take the final. Um, this I like this better than the than the form A form B with retakes because I think that um, our struggling students aren't going to study everything and our strong students are going to read everything again and they shouldn't have to and they already have some I think kind of unhealthy work habits they're up all night they're engaged in three sports they volunteer and they're studying their little brains out because they're they don't they're not confident that they know everything that's going to be on the test. So something like this helps our strong students devote their effort to what they really need to learn, and it helps our struggling students target whatever effort they're going to put into to their areas of greatest need. Another thing I'd like to show you is, um, now I'm going to go back to screen share, so hang on a sec. My computer is taking its sweet time. Um, the Claire's math activity is actually on fossil page 19 um, also. So the, it is an activity set up for people to do. And then creating the form that for, for engaging in this, um, the activity, there, there are, um, it's the activity for making your own version of that form is on Castle pages 165 and 166. So if, you might, if you're interested in taking that f either of those further, you might want to look at those pages. And then the last page in your handout is this. It is a primary example, and this one does come from the Seven Strategies book. Um, and in this primary example, the learning targets are written on the practice test. So if you look at page 22 in your handout, um, this is... Um, this is Casey and uh, second grade. And Casey's teacher has, um, there's more than one page to this quiz. I just put one page in here. Students march, mark each learning target in the box. There's a little box next to the number with a star symbol or a stair step after they've completed it to show whether they, they think they know, I know how to do this, or I'm not really sure, I might need more practice with this. And then the teacher comes back over and corrects it, quote unquote, corrects it with a star or a stair step. And, uh, and then on this, in this case, um, Casey managed to get all of them correct on his whole piece, so she wrote a little note to him. And we use the star and the stair. Um, the difference between the word star and the word stair is the letter I. What have I done well? What am I going to do next? Or what do I still need to work on? It's a much more forward-looking stance to feedback than calling one positive and the other negative because the learning is in the, is in the stare, in the next step feedback. And I, don't, I just don't like us having to call the learning piece negative. This isn't something wrong with you. This is a natural part of learning, and it's what's next. So those star and stare symbols are intended to help students um, 
start thinking that way more about the feedback we give them. The last thing we're going to do here is um, is a debrief of this of this um, whole um, preparing using a test plan to to help students think about their own learning. Um, I'm going to ask you to have somebody do each each group has a die right a single die that's a pair of dice a one die. So one person's going to grab the die don't and don't roll it yet but you're going to roll it and the person on your left is going to when you roll let's say you land on a three the person on your left is going to read out loud what's next to number three up here one way I can use this and then the person on your left has to answer and then you pass the die to someone else and the person on that person's left has to answer so they roll let's say the next person gets a four so the person on the left what per, one person I like to share this with and then share um, so if the instructions aren't clear, somebody at your table has figured this out. So the person who's figured it out, go ahead and take the die and get started. And we'll take about five minutes on this. I love it, Jan. So my, my friend, my good friend Beth brought, um, she had, she brought a whole huge bag of dice for us. <laughs> so. God bless her. I thought that was very smart not to be getting dice all night, but just tell people to bring them. Yeah. <laughs> so how are we doing, Anita? Awesome. Thank you. 
All right, we're at oops. all right, we're at the home stretch for lunch. So if you will turn your attention back to Gina, please and thank you. Are we ready? We are. Okay. So let's let's look at this as these assessment planning steps. So we've got we've we've looked at steps one, two, three, and four. The first step is determine assessment purpose. <clears throat> and I'd just like to in in your thinking about the summative assessments, I want to make sure that that we don't lose sight of the student. So we can design a summative assessment that we can design a second form of that that allows our students to get better along the way before uh, before we put the summative in place so p1 clear or q1 clear purpose and step one determine assessment purpose let's not forget the student assessments designed with students needs in mind the assessment itself functions with effective feedback as you saw with this test if the targets are clear to students and they have been practicing those targets, you've been teaching to the targets, then the test results or the quiz results themselves tell students what they're good at and what they need to work on. Students understand the results. Students know what to do next. They can self-assess and set goals. And they're more likely to keep trying. So step one, full purpose. Step two, clear targets. Step three, which assessment method is going to give you accurate results? And then step four, roll it all together, roll these decisions together, and uh, make a test blueprint that allows you to create multiple forms of the same assessment as needed before you begin to create your items. So, do it right, use it well. Thank you all very much. Okay, can we uh, just do a little bit of a debrief for just for just a few minutes? Uh, thank you so Hi. much. That was wonderful. Uh, it's amazing how much we can get done listening, but also just getting engaged and talking. So any um, like takeaways was in a, from this overall session uh, that or questions you might have for Jim? Again, this is that rare opportunity to ask the author. You do that kind of method. Here's the author. Here's your chance. Okay. So the question was about early childhood, that kindergarten, first grade application of this. I think that's really an excellent point. Mm -hmm. So what might that look like at that grade level? Yes. Well, all right, let's talk about letter formation. That's simple enough, right? So we're learning how to make a J. So we have a vision of what makes a good letter J. We've got the letters J up on the, um, up on the wall and students are practicing creating J's. You can have them look at the example and circle their J that they think is closest to that and tell you why. Um, once they understand that their their goal is to learn how to make a letter J that do, that has certain characteristics, so even though this is very simple, a, a the correct formation of J has got a couple of uh, things to pay attention to, and so those are the criteria for J. So we use a very the same protocol, um, but with instead of students um, with the second grade student making a star or a stair step, having the students just circle the one they think is the best that they did is, is one example of it. How are we doing on that? Okay, I think I see the head nod back there. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> oh, another, other, other question now that you're thinking about this. For an idea or a concept? Yes. Yes. So, like the staff has a ways to go in this. Where 
where would you start? Do you think, I mean, I, I can see this being overwhelming. You try to say, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to have our students now look at this assessment and say what they're good at or not. And you're like, I'm not even sure what the target is. So wait a minute, I don't want to do this. So, so what would be the baby steps of getting your staff involved in this so that make progress? Great question. Did you hear that, Jan? <coughs> What are the baby steps? Because um, the problem is that staff might not tell me what staff might not do again. Well, if, if again you're unsure of the, the that the learning yeah. are clear, or if you're saying, okay, let's just haul out your assessments and go at it with this, you know, uh, protocol that you have. Uh, if your assessment isn't well, doesn't meet those uh, quality standards, or you haven't really gone through the design process, where do you start? It's almost an over so. Is it start back at the beginning? Is it go ahead and analyze this yeah. assessment for what it is and then go back to the beginning or where would you say? Well, what I would say is that when you're creating an assessment, because you are creating an assessment, when you're creating an assessment, you think about the purpose. If you want to think about having students also use the assessment results, then what you're going to do is, uh, not tomorrow maybe, but, um, but, um, think about um, the purpose for your assessment and then make sure that your targets are clear and you might people often spend quite a bit of time just working on clear targets and deconstructing and making sure those are in good shape that's a prerequisite um, being able to create or select good items so understanding um, let's say you're going to create a selected risk test you are going to be or at least have part of selected response in it you're going to be using chapter five in the castle book perhaps to guide your your development of your items um, uh, or written response you're going to be using castle chapter six to guide the development of those or it's a performance assessment what makes a good task what makes a good rubric you need to understand how to do all those things before we involve students in the assessment itself um, I share this right now because it gives a really good uh, example of what you can do with a test blueprint when you have one. Um, but the prerequisites, I think, I think your perhaps instinct is is right on there that there are prerequisites. People, if their targets aren't clear, um, if they haven't been clear to students all along, if we aren't sharing our targets with students and so they know what it is they're practicing, if we haven't aligned their practice to the intended learning, but we're assigning the odd numbered problems or the front of the page and not the back of the page, then um, it all comes down to the targets, really. When, when we are in good shape with our targets and we have our classroom aligned to the intended learning, the activities, the practice activities, and the summative assessments, then we can move into using them formatively with students. Until then, it's probably not a good idea to even use the assessment because it's not accurate information to have students practice on things they weren't taught because that's, that's pretty destructive to the struggling learner. Um, so I say that I guess the basis for this is that clear target piece. Kind of why we started out with you last time right when we looked at the formative strategies it was all about really practicing the i can this means really getting clear and i think your point's really great about if we don't even know what that means as teachers right as we're looking at some of those standards and trying to unpack them then it's surely not clear to students and then it's the match between the learning activities the learning tasks all of those pieces is that clear that they're getting that sort of uh, um, feedback and then that they that they're practicing being able to do that themselves so i i would agree too that you know that's you can't you can't overemphasize that importance because it is the hinge point one of the things i have noticed anita and i'm just going to share this very briefly is that i i do this activity or something like it in workshops um all the time and teachers find it is something, it's the one thing they can take back and do tomorrow um, if they have clear targets. And many teachers do. So I'm not assuming that people don't know what they're teaching. I mean, people do know what they're teaching. And so if you have a unit and you've got your targets laid out and, and 
particularly secondary people who are often used to creating their own tests, if they are used to creating their own tests and they do, and this test blueprint idea isn't, isn't totally foreign, then it's a pretty easy next step to doing this. So it just depends on the background knowledge of the person hearing it. other things that are on your mind before we close up the screen share? Sure. One more? <laughs> Going twice? <laughs> no? Okay. Well, I appreciate uh, the, all of the work, uh, and especially because we've really covered quite a bit of ground here. So thank you, Jan. Thank I'd like you. to let you, uh, you back to the West Coast time. Jan, we have our University of Maine folks here. Could you do a shout out because we were yeah, talking right. about um, the newest book that you're just finishing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so hello, University of Maine folks. I, we, Rick and I have just finished, a, 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 it'll have a 2017 um, pub date, but it'll be out in um, summer um, of 2016. And it is a, it is a, a version of the castle text and a bit of a combination of the seven strategies text set up for pre-service. Um, so no, no assumption about what you already know in the classroom, beginning thinking about 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds, 22-year-olds, people who may or may not have done any student teaching yet or who are in the, the process of doing that. So we've targeted this. We really believe that um, that this ought not all be in-service information. Much of this can be learned before you step foot in the class. And what does it mean to be well equipped to handle the assessment challenges of the class on day one? So that was our purpose for writing this book. It's actually a seventh edition, but it had it's got major revisions to it. So thank you for listening to my little testimonial about my own book. Thanks so much, Ian. Talk with you soon. All right. You're welcome. Bye-bye.